Hey, hey, welcome to my sketchy little corner of the internet. Today we're covering the case of David Berkowitz, known as the Son of Sam. He is a serial killer who terrorized New York from 1976 to 1977. Most serial killers, as we know, get their nicknames from the media, but this guy picked his own very uninspired nickname. It doesn't really strike the same level of apprehension as, say, Daughter of Karen. I'll be sketching one of his victims, who we will talk about, but we will also talk about his excuse for the murders, which is a truly bizarre combination of The Devil Made Me Do It and The Dog Ate My Homework. We will also talk about the allegations that a cult was involved in the killings and that there was more than one killer. And of course, we will talk about the composite sketches. So, let's jump right in. On July the 29th, 1976, two young women, both in the medical profession, Jodie Valenti and Donna Loria, were sitting in Jodie's car in front of Donna's home in the Bronx. They had just come back from a night out at a local disco. Donna was getting out of the car to go inside when they saw a man quickly walking towards them carrying a paper bag. Suddenly, he pulled a 44 caliber gun from the bag and he started shooting, hitting both girls. Donna was killed and Jody was injured. The man lowered his gun and walked away quickly. Donna's father came outside to discover his daughter and her friend. He rushed them to the hospital, but sadly his daughter had already died from her injuries before they had even arrived. Jody was understandably completely beside herself with shock and terror, as can be expected. But she had gotten a look at the man, and she described the killer as a white man in his 30s with a fair complexion and dark curly hair, about 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighing around 200 pounds. A similarly described man was seen by other witnesses sitting in a yellow car near the house that day. There was some speculation at the time that this was a mafia hit, but that they just targeted the wrong people. On October the 23rd, the killer struck again. Carl DeNaro and Rosemary Keenan were on a date and were sitting in Rosemary's parked car, just having a chat, you know, as you do when suddenly, out of nowhere, the windows shattered as though they had exploded. Rosemary was freaked out and she basically hauled ass and started speeding away. She then realized that Carl had been shot in the head. He luckily survived, but he needed surgery and a metal plate in his head to replace some of his skull. Rosemary wasn't shot. And at first, they had no idea what had happened. They didn't even realize they had been shot at. And they hadn't seen a shooter. The police, however, found 44 caliber bullets lodged in the car. At this point, the two incidents were not connected by the police. And they occurred in different police districts. Later, it was assumed that the shooter actually mistook Carl for a woman because he had longer hair at the time. On November the 27th, Donna DeMaisi and Joanna Lamino, who were both high school students, were walking home from a movie. They arrived at Joanne's home and they were just standing on the front porch, finishing their discussion and basically saying their goodbyes when a man approached them. He asked for directions in a very high-pitched voice and then he pulled out a gun. He shot multiple times, hitting Donna in the neck and Joanne in the back. A neighbor heard the shots and he ran outside in time to see a blonde man holding a gun run past. Both girls survived the shooting, but Joanne was sadly left in a wheelchair. On January the 30th, 1977, Christine Frond, a secretary who was 26, and her fiancé, John Deal, a bartender who was 30 at the time, were both sitting in his Pontiac Firebird parked in Queens. They were young, in love, and excited to start their lives together. 
Christine had been born in Salzburg, Austria. She and John were on a date that night. They had just been to see Rocky, and then they had gone to dinner. A man fired three shots at them from a short distance. John was not hit, but when he turned to check on Christine, he found her slumped over in the car. She had been shot in the head, and she died in the hospital a short while later. Police recovered the 44 caliber bullets, and then they finally connected the murders. People in New York were terrified. Couples would stay away from lover's lane type of locations, and women even started cutting their hair because it was rumored that women with long brown hair were being targeted. On March the 8th, he struck again, and this time his MO had actually changed. The victim was 20-year-old student, Virginia, and I hope I don't mess this up too badly, Voskarichian, and she was walking to her home from the subway station. She had tried to shield herself unsuccessfully with her textbooks. This crime was a lot riskier within a public place, and police thought that perhaps he was trying to throw them off. By this time, the story was reaching even international media, and there was a lot of fear and panic. On April the 17th, another couple sitting in a car in the Bronx were shot. Alexander Esau and Valentina Suriani were both struck twice, and they both sadly died. Valentina died immediately at the scene, and Alexander in the hospital. This time, the killer had left a note near the scene of the shooting, addressed to the police. You can find it online, and it is a garbled mess, but here is a small part of it. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to Yahoo's, to the people of Queens, I love you, and I want to wish you all a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next, and for now I say goodbye and good night. Police, let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back, I'll be back, to be interpreted as bang, 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 ugh. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster, end quote. They dusted this note for fingerprints, and after eliminating the police officers who had handled the note, they found prints, but then they realized that the killer had only used the very tips of his fingers to touch the note, so they were unable to get a match. Then a journalist received a letter, and this letter, you can also find this one, And it's a lot more eloquent. It's almost chillingly so. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but some of it reads. Hello from the gutters of NYC, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine and blood. Hello from the sewers of NYC, which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed on the dried blood of the dead that has settled into the cracks. Mr. Breslin, sir, don't think that because you haven't heard from me for a while that I went to sleep. No, rather I am still here, like a spirit roaming the night, thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work, now the void has been filled. End quote. He ended this letter by referring to himself as the son of Sam. And in this letter, he also refers to, quote, John Wheaties, rapist and suffocator of young girls, end quote. Remember that for later, because I'm going to circle back to it. This guy actually reminds me a lot of the Zodiac Killer. They sought out similar victims, they had similar modus operandi, and they both wrote to the police and the media. On June the 26th, 1977, he struck yet again. 
Judy Placido, who was 17, and San Lupo, who was 20, met at a disco in Queens and they left together about five hours later. They were sitting in a car about a block away from the club when they were shot at. They were both injured, but they both survived. And witnesses at this shooting described a tall, dark-haired man leaving the scene. On July the 31st, Stacey Moskowitz and Robert Violente, both 20, were on their first date. The couple sat in a parked car across from a playground in Brooklyn. They were kissing at the time they were shot. One of the bullets hit Robert's left eye and destroyed it entirely. It also severely damaged his right eye and he was left blind. Stacy was killed. Witnesses saw a man wearing a blonde wig or a light-coloured wig running from the scene and speed away in a yellow car. And a man was nearly struck by a yellow VW Beetle speeding away. And he described the driver as a man in his 20s or 30s with long stringy hair and a bit of a beard. Another witness who saw this out the window positively identified David Berkowitz as a man she saw walking away from the scene while other people were rushing towards it. Right before this incident, a woman walking her dog saw an officer putting parking tickets on a few cars and she then crossed paths with a dark-haired man who made her very nervous and who seemed to be holding a dark object in his hand. The shooting occurred just minutes later. Four days later, she went to the police with this information and the police started looking at all the cars that had received parking tickets in that area that night. David had received a ticket for parking his yellow Ford Galaxy near a fire hydrant about an hour before the shooting. He lived in Yonkers at the time, and Yonkers police actually had their suspicions about him already because there were a number of crimes alluded to in the Son of Sam letters that he was sending that they thought he was responsible for. So police surrounded his apartment and waited for him to come out because Firstly, they were waiting for a search warrant, and secondly, they wanted to avoid a violent altercation inside the building. It was reported by Newsday later that they had found a submachine gun and a letter to the police with a map of various recreational areas on Long Island in his car. So they speculated that he was actually planning a mass shooting on Long Island. David eventually walked out of the building and he was arrested. His response was something to the effect of, well, you got me, what took you so long? Now, David was not what they had envisioned. He was a quiet, mild-mannered postal worker. He was born in 1953. His mother gave him up for adoption after his father, who was married to another woman at the time, threatened her. He had been adopted at a young age and raised by a Jewish couple. However, he had a troubled childhood. He was described as a bully and started getting into trouble at a young age for theft and arson. His adoptive parents tried to get him psychological help, but it didn't seem to make much of a difference. He had served in the military at some point, and he had a number of jobs. He was deeply upset when he found out he had been adopted and found the story about his birth and adoption. He seemed inconspicuous in day-to-day life, but the inside of his apartment told a very different story. It was an absolute pigsty to start with. There were notebooks filled with details of fires he had set all around the city, more than a thousand. There was what was described as satanic graffiti on the walls. He had written things like, In this hole lives the Wicker King on his wall. It also seems that he may have attacked two women with a knife before the shootings. Both fortunately survived. After his arrest, he told psychiatrists that demons spoke to him through a black Labrador named Harvey that belonged to his neighbor, Sam Carr, 
and that the demon ordered him to kill neat, clean, and well-groomed young people and to get the blood of pretty girls. He was found mentally competent for trial, and he ended up pleading guilty. At his sentencing hearing, he tried to jump out of the window, and he was taunting families by saying, for example, um, that the victim was a whore, and it was just terrible, really, really awful guy. He was again evaluated, and he was found competent, and he was sentenced to six terms of 25 years to life. He admitted later that his story about demons was a hoax. But in 1979, he started this narrative that he was part of a satanic cult who jointly committed the murders. He said he could not reveal the names of other members of the cult because it would put his family in danger. I find this a little odd because allegedly he had no relationship with his family and he didn't really stay in touch with them much. And an FBI profiler who had interviewed David at length stated that he was not likely to be involved in a cult since he wasn't able to maintain any sustained social relationships. It has also been said that one of the composites looks a lot like a man called John Wheaties. Do you remember that name? I said we would circle back to it. John Wheaties was the son of Sam Carr, David's neighbor. John died shortly after David's arrest by what appears to be a suicide. It is believed by some that John was involved with a satanic cult. But if that's true, and David couldn't possibly reveal the names of the cult members because he feared for his family's safety, why would he have initially made an effort to basically frame John for the shootings in the letters? That makes no sense. It is also rumoured that a satanic cult would meet in Untermeyer Park, a dilapidated garden filled with ruins of buildings from the 1920s and 30s. It was said that they would wear dark cloaks and they would chant. I'm not sure how these details were revealed about this super secretive, dangerous cult who meets in a super secret, wide open, publicly accessible space wearing completely non-suspicious items of clothing. Something that is weird, though, is that police kept finding dead German shepherds in the aqueduct adjacent to the park. So that is admittedly a little bit suspicious. And the police had suspicions from the start that there may have been more than one shooter. So let's talk about the composites. The description of the killer varied so much, and this translates into very, very different composites. Some of them are more likely to be of David, but others are very different. And the hair especially is very telling. People generally remember hair pretty well when giving descriptions for composites. It's one of those identifying features we tend to pick up on and recall in better detail later. Satanic panic was at its peak in the 1980s when David was making these claims. And it's worth noting that of the numerous claims and investigations that were undertaken at this time into satanic cults and sects, all were discredited or disproven. And in fact, in some cases, such as England, the investigations into so-called satanic cults who were apparently abusing children funneled much-needed public funds away from organizations dealing with actual credible child abuse cases. Angsty teenagers were keen to be associated with Satanism because... I don't really know, actually. Maybe they thought it made them look badass to run around vandalizing stuff and chanting Hail Satan and killing animals and putting graffiti on stuff. But that's all it was. Investigations never found any kind of organized cults or evidence of the ritual abuse that was claimed. The satanic cult theory is certainly mysterious, and interesting, and sensational. But I personally have my doubts about it. David was a lonely man, and I believe that even liars tell the truth sometimes. He admitted to making up the demon story to justify the killings, because he couldn't admit that he did it of his own free will. 
and he admitted to one psychiatrist that he had contemplated murder for a long time because he wanted to get back at a world who had rejected and hurt him. And this, I believe, is the truth. And I believe that the cult story is just another variation of the demon story. He doesn't want to fully accept responsibility. It's easier to say that someone else made him do it. And when he started getting notoriety, maybe he felt important. Maybe he felt that he finally had the upper hand. He could create fear and chaos. And in this way, he could hurt a society who had hurt him. He liked the notoriety. He craved the attention. He courted it. So if another copycat killer was active at the same time, it stands to reason that he may have taken credit for all of it. After all, this wasn't really a new MO. As I said, it's very, very similar to the Zodiac murders that took place just a few years prior. Anyway, that's it for this case. Thank you so much for watching. Hit the subscribe button to support this channel, and I will see you next time.